Hello and welcome to Naked Agility with Martin Hinchelwood. I'm Martin Hinchelwood and I'm going to be talking about the live site culture and site reliability in the Azure DevOps team at Microsoft. Okay, hey, and welcome. Um, today, uh, I want to talk a little bit about site reliability engineering. It's something that um, I spend a lot of time thinking about because I have many customers who also have operational needs as well as having uh, the, the typical engineering needs uh, that they have. And I think it's important uh, to find that balance uh, between engineering and operations. And the Azure DevOps team uh, have an interesting story about how they've managed to create uh, that, that balance and create a culture inside of their organization uh, supporting uh, live site um, and, and, and doing it with engineering teams. So we're going to um, cover uh, quite a few different topics. Um, I, have, I have a lot of information here about how uh, the Azure DevOps team do their work as well as how they interact with us, the customers. Um, but just to give you a, a, an overview, we're going to talk about uh, transparency and how, to, how they've managed to build trust with their customers. Um, we're going to talk about the amount uh, of telemetry that they collect and how they organize uh, that. So how, how, how open and transparent actually are they with customers and, and how much telemetry do they collect? And then how do they um, organize themselves around responding uh, to things that happen? So there's gonna be plenty of things that happen. Uh, they, do, they do Scrum, um, they have three week sprints. How do they make sure that they're still able to deliver value um, while also uh, being able to um, get other things done as well. Uh, get their operational. What if the site goes down? What if uh, there are other pieces of work that would make uh, the site more efficient and less likely to go down? How do they prioritize that work? Um, so, so stuff around that. Uh, and then we can have a little bit of discussion about automation. Uh, automation is very important for an agile story. Uh, we talk about all the time in, in, in Scrum that your definition of done, uh, at the end of every sprint, your uh, application should be potentially shippable with no further work required by the engineering team to make that happen. So if your business decides let's ship to production, there's not anything else for the engineering team to do. Ultimately, your product owner uh, can just push, push a button and ship to production and that should be uh, as much as is necessary um, and then this a the little bit of a discussion around investigation and getting uh, to the root cause and how to continually improve in your environment and i think that's that's important as well we talk a lot about in in complex systems it can be impossible to get to a root cause uh, and i think if 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 that were true uh, we would never visit the doctor because there would be no point. Uh, there are certain causes that we can identify. Uh, we may not get everything, but we can certainly uh, do our due diligence and figure out how to get there. Uh, but first, I have a, a, a little short uh, story about an organization uh, that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, it's the story of how a company with nearly $400 million in assets went bankrupt in 45 minutes because of a failed deployment. Um, this was a company uh, called the Knight Capital Group. They were listed uh, on the New York uh, Stock Exchange and they were um, implementing effectively a new order handling system that allowed them to create uh, child orders. Uh, this allowed them 
uh, to do something they hadn't done before, um, but it required that they replace the old code with new code and be able to integrate from there. Um, and it was really nine, nine years of application building that had gone into this system. So you can imagine if you have nine years of uh, code in there, there's going to be maybe a lot of spaghetti. Uh, there's going to be a lot of difficult areas, lots of leftover things that people have just built and ignored for many years. Um, so they did decide to repurpose uh, an existing flag in the system in order to activate the new code. So that was one of the things that they did, uh, which potentially could have a negative result or negative impact. Um, but at deployment time, their engineer, their technician doing the deployment, only copied the new code to seven of the eight environments. Uh, then uh, they flipped the switch, turned on that flag, and they went live. Because they had that uh, fault in uh, the number of servers that were active uh, with the new code, um, the system was not, I was going to say performing correctly, but uh, 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 not, not operating normally. It was doing strange things. It wasn't able to process the, the orders at all that were coming through. And they started losing uh, just under $200,000 per minute um, because the system wasn't, wasn't working as expected. They then, obviously, they're going to try and fix it. So they drop everything. Um, everybody's hair's on fire. They come running trying to, to figure it out. And they just, they couldn't figure out uh, what the problem was uh, for that whole day. So they spent a whole day with the system down. Um, they couldn't figure out what the problem was. They didn't understand that uh, uh, it was just one server that was acting up. Everything looked like it was normal. You go test a server. Everything's good. Why is this not working? Couldn't figure it out. And at the end of that day, uh, they were losing, they, 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 they lost $460 million and they filed for uh, bankruptcy protection. An interesting question you might ask yourself is what would be the impact in your organization of a key or critical platform that you create or that you create for your customers? being being down for that length of time um what what can you do to prevent it it's interesting we know a lot about what happened to the night capital group because they're a public they were a publicly listed company um and you can see their sec filing uh, and go and see what happened uh, but they had no uh automation um they they um no procedures for backout plans, no, no, no anything. Uh, so that's, it was a massive uh, risk for the organizations. Um, and really, uh, we need to think about how do you get better at doing something like that? One of the things that I see a lot of organizations doing is thinking that they can create, uh, uh, they can create a backout plan, that they can uh, reverse the thing that they failed to do forwards and be successful at it. If you can't be successful at deploying your product, the chances of you being able to uh, reverse that deployment are a lot lower than your ability to deploy in the first place. Um, so I think it, 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 it's really a losing proposition. Uh, one of the things that I see most engineering organizations that move towards uh, uh, continuous delivery, move towards DevOps, move towards delivering faster, is that they observe a roll forwards mentality uh, rather than enabling things like rollback, which are just really not, not viable anymore. Uh, so Microsoft has made a lot of changes uh, over the last few years. Uh, 10 years ago, Microsoft was a waterfall organization. No matter how much they, you know, you, you saw tools for maybe doing agile things, they were a waterfall organization. They were deploying uh, uh, Visual Studio and TFS uh, every two years. Uh, that's the particular department uh, that I'm going to talk about uh, today inside of Microsoft. Um, and times have changed. 
They were deploying every two years. They were doing a service pack halfway. And that's no longer uh, viable. It's no longer okay to uh, respond to feedback from your customers on those type of timeframes. Um, and a, a big example of that has been uh, at Windows uh, with their uh, Windows 8 a massive failure of understanding the customer's needs. So there was a big disconnect um, and a multi-billion dollar uh, loss there for basically not having tighter feedback loops. So it is important. It is something that you will need to do with your uh, customers. Shorten those feedback loops, understand uh, uh, their needs a little bit better and get things out the door. And even the Windows team uh, who deploy to nearly a billion machines uh, worldwide um, and have four and a half thousand software engineers working on their product are now uh, doing continuous delivery to production. Um, and the, the, we get it, you get it as a, a general public um, every 30 days. Uh, it used to be Patch Tuesday. Now it's a whole new version of Windows Tuesday and has new features, new capabilities on that continuous cadence so they can get feedback. They do have shorter cadences as well. They're not just deploying once a month. Um, I have two machines here that are on the Windows Insider group, uh, which I get weekly deployments as long as everything looks good. Um, and if you're inside of Microsoft and on a, a, a corporate build machine, uh, which the CEO uh, is, then you get daily builds from the dev branch uh, of the Windows. So it's important, quality is important. So they've actually gone from uh, maybe deploying once or twice a year uh, across even all of their products uh, going to production once or twice a year um, to something that looks a, a little bit more more staggering. Um, over 163,000 deployments per day. That's to any environment, uh, but that's an incredible uh, uh, figure across the, across the organization. And that's with 96,000 engineers. So there's more than one deployment per day per engineer inside of Microsoft now. Uh, Two million uh, Git commits uh, per month, uh, 500 million text executions uh, per day. This is, this is a lot of data, a lot of things going on. Um, and in order to uh, support that, the team that builds the product, so Microsoft uses a product called Azure DevOps, which used to be called TFS. It's also been called Visual Studio Online. It's also been called uh, TFS. TF services, what else is this? It's had a bit of an identity crisis over the years, uh, but the Azure DevOps platform um, has been Microsoft's platform of choice. It, it was built in order to support their transition towards uh, this new way of working. Um, and almost everybody inside of Microsoft is now uh, using it to manage their work and deploy. Some of them have moved over onto uh, GitHub uh, for source control, uh, but for work item tracking, uh, for um, automated builds, uh, the majority of folks inside of Microsoft, my understanding is they're using Azure DevOps. Um, so it was built with, with that in mind, with scale in mind, uh, with things that, that large in mind, and this slide is from Donovan Brown's uh, uh, presentation. It's uh, fairly big numbers. So in order to support uh, this, um, so creating the, the platform that Microsoft and many other people around the world use uh, to, to, to manage uh, their, their engineering efforts, uh, the Azure DevOps team had to create uh, this live site culture inside of their organization. Um, one of the things that they, they really focus on is um, you, you code it, you build it, you deploy it, you run it. Um, if you're going to be the one that writes the code, you should be the one uh, that gets up at three o'clock in the morning because uh, uh, the thing that you've written is not working properly. Uh, there's some caveats to that that we'll talk about as we go through, uh, but ultimately the software engineers, the people writing the code need to feel the pain uh, of any sort of problems with either deployment or uh, supporting the product or managing it online uh, of security of all of the things that would be a problem. So they don't necessarily have 
other departments that manage these things now. Uh, this is one of the big transitions between, or, or the big, uh, 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 yeah, transition is the right word, but the big flip uh, for organizations is that change from being a, a, a predominantly uh, uh, um, departmental based organization uh, towards being uh, cross-functional delivery teams who are able to take an idea and get it all the way to production uh, without needing to be dependent upon external teams. That's really important for that transition towards uh, a greater degree of agility because if, as soon as you're dependent upon somebody else outside of your organization that has different uh, motivations, different uh, 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 priorities, then uh, you're not going to be able to get things done very quickly because you're going to, at some point, you're going to have to wait for them. Uh, we have to remove those wait times. So we bring, rather than ha going out to an external part, uh, department, we bring that department into uh, the team. Uh, so there's representation on the team of security, of legal, of um, obviously coding, engineering, uh, test, uh, operations, um, all of those uh, ideas, those hats, those roles are represented inside of the team. Um, you need to automate, uh, you need to learn and share with each other all the time. Um, we need to be getting better at what we do constantly. Um, and, and we need a lot of data to help us figure out what's going on, what's happening. Um, and anybody that manages a live site will know uh, that live uh, comes first. Uh, no matter what you're doing, if production is down, uh, you're going to have to drop everything you're doing and go go figure that out. So how do we make sure um, that we support that in a way of organizing people? And this is about how the Azure DevOps team have managed to do that. So this is, this is an example, a story of a way uh, that you can do that. Um, don't just take the way they're doing things and implement it yourself. You want to see what works for you in your organization, in your organizational, uh, within your organizational constraints, within your application and platform constraints as well. This particular team is building a, a web application, uh, but there are other teams inside of Microsoft that use a similar uh, process in order to manage uh, desktop as well as Windows and other uh, types of application models. Uh, so you need to create a culture uh, within which uh, this 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 works. And LiveSide is about bringing uh, the right people together uh, from both app and platform, so that uh, we can continue uh, uh, to, to keep our system up, to have uh, the the lovely things that we as uh, users of the system uh, really really want. But why, why is it so important to keep uh, everything up? Well, there's some headlines that are great examples of uh, how those things have been uh, difficult for organizations in the past. Uh, Visual Studio Online, which was one of the names for uh, um, Azure DevOps, um, has, has had outages. They have had outages. Um, it's not possible uh, for a system not to have outages. It's about how you deal with them when they happen. Uh, so uh, Visual Studio Online, Azure has been down, uh, Amazon has been down, uh, and there's a, a startup with 25 million in funding in crisis because an employee deleted the wrong files. These, these things happen. We want to do our best to prevent those things from happening. We want to do our best to respond to those things when they do happen. And we want to do our best to make sure that things that do happen don't continue to happen. And that's how we build uh, uh, trust with our customers. Because really we've, we've got to be able to deploy new features. That's the, the, the ultimate um, battle between engineering and operations is that idea of uh, 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 engineering is measured by the number of fantastic features they get into uh, production, uh, but operations is measured by uptime. And generally those things are antagonistic. If you want to keep it up, you don't deploy new features. If you want to deploy new features, you're not going to be able to keep it up. So there's a fight there. But when we bring 
those two groups together, they can have a real conversation about how they can do both of those things and still be able to delight their customers, have high levels of uptime, have fantastic features and be able to move forward. And that's really uh, what I want to talk about as we go through uh, this today. Um, so uh, first thing I want to talk about is transparency. How do we, uh, how does this team build transparency uh, with their customers? So I'm going to kind of split, try and split between uh, good practices, complementary practices that you can use with your Scrum team or your Kanban team uh, as part of your Agile practices, as well as what this team specifically has done. Uh, so I am going to show uh, some of the details and governs of the work that they've done around that. Um, but we need transparency to build trust with our customers. We need to be understanding uh, of things when they happen, as well as doing our best to understand how and why they happened and so that we can figure out what to do about it. Uh, customers are not happy if you just tell them the system was down, we rebooted the server, and now it's back up again. Why was it down? Is it going to go down again? We, we no longer have a level of confidence in your ability to maintain that system if you don't even know why uh, there's a problem with it or why it's going down. Uh, so we, we need to understand that and build transparency to build trust with our customers. Uh, so this is an example um, of some of the output you will get uh, from the Azure DevOps team. Uh, you'll be able to go find on um, the Visual Studio, uh, well, that's this is uh, from the Visual Studio Team Services blog. It's the same blog. It's just been moved around a little bit, uh, but it's the Azure DevOps uh, blog. Uh, they do a full post-mortem uh, and they publish all of the data. Um, they publish it to show um, here if you, uh, maybe I can, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to zoom in. There's my magnifying glass. There we go. Uh, they, they show uh, the data, when things went bad, uh, what they've investigated in order to understand what went bad, how they've managed or tried to mitigate it, the actions they took, and the timeline uh, that that uh, went through. So that's a really uh, powerful uh, story there. Um, they also uh, publish an idea of uh, what they're going to go do to go fix it as well. Uh, so if I zoom out, there we go. They're going to make a bunch of commitment to their customers to improve the service, to make sure that that type of problem, those uh, outages don't happen again. Uh, for every outage uh, of Azure DevOps, uh, big and small, uh, you will find uh, these types of posts and this type of data. Uh, the smaller the outage, the, the less impact the outage, obviously the less effort you want to spend in some of these areas. Uh, but when the whole system's down, you're going to see a post uh, that looks like this with a bunch of uh, data in it. Um, and the leadership of the Azure DevOps team is adamant that they want to uh, uh, create that transparency. Uh, this is a post from uh, a reply uh, that Brian Harry, who was the product unit manager for that department, who really instigated those ideas of moving to the cloud uh, and um, um, empowered that part of the organization uh, to make the changes that, that, that resulted in them being uh, um, becoming an agile organization, delivering to production um, at least every three weeks. And you can see the type of transparency uh, that he's trying to create. He's saying, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to be successful 100% of the time. That's just reality. We have to accept uh, uh, reality. There's no such thing as 100% uptime. It's just not possible. No matter what uh, uh, folks say, you have to have downtime for maintenance. You have to have... Uh, um, you have to have a little bit of wiggle room. You can't be 100% up. But how do we uh, make sure that we minimize the amount of downtime that we have? Well, there's lots of things uh, that we can do. Uh, the first is to, to the communication, letting people know that you know that there's downtime, uh, that there's some sort of problem, that uh, um, 
there's an issue. Uh, this is an application that the Azure DevOps team had created in 2013. It was just a spreadsheet uh, and it was 45 minutes uh, was their time to notify uh, their customers and uh, uh, us as the users. Um, but in 2017, that's down to 15 minutes. Within 15 minutes of that red button getting pushed, understanding that there's a problem, uh, there's something up on the status page, there's something up on the blog, and for the internal uh, Microsoft customers and the key stakeholders, uh, there are emails going out to the people that need to know. Um, I have a, a couple of customers who are in the top uh, 20 uh, largest customers on Azure DevOps, and they get notifications almost before they know that there's a problem, which is really powerful for them as well, to then be able to um, have the real discussions they need inside of their organization. Yes, we're aware of the problem. Microsoft's working to fix it. You know, those things that build trust. If we know, we understand, we're aware, uh, we can do that. So in order to, to preempt this, you've got the, uh, I remember one of uh, my, my good friends at, um, at Microsoft when they first moved to the cloud. Uh, said one of the reasons that he made his first, uh, got onto Twitter first, uh, was when they moved to the cloud, because he found out from people on Twitter that the system was down before his engineering team knew that the system was down. Because we as software engineers, being that the customers are software engineers as well, are particularly uh, uh -huh, um, whingy and complaining group of people. Uh, we are happy to uh, point the finger when something's not working properly. Um, and he found out first there. So how do you create an environment within which you know first, not your customers? You don't want your customers to know before you do that there's a problem with the system. And for that, we need telemetry. We need data. Uh, and we need to understand that data in order to create uh, the right alerts to know what we're supposed to do um, when 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 that problem arises. Is that a problem we need to care about? Is that a problem that might go away? Do we just need to um, kind of saunter up to that problem or do we need to run up to that problem with, with everybody that we need? So um, figuring out what we can do to prevent incidents by looking at the data and seeing when things might be, you know, okay, that was a bit... Uh, that data did not look good. If we'd had more users on the system at that point in time, we would have had a problem. What can we do to make sure uh, that next time, whatever that data is that spikes or drops in the way that it did, uh, how do we make sure that we uh, get that moving? So um, incident prevention, uh, continuous improvement. How do we continually go around those loops, identifying the root causes and figuring it out? Uh, the Azure DevOps team have created their own um, telemetry pipeline so that they can uh, understand that data and do something with it. Uh, they have implemented it in uh, a lot of the, the Azure. Since their servers are deployed to Azure, they can take advantage of some of that Azure infrastructure that's there for everybody anyway. Uh, they don't have any special powers in Azure. Azure treats them like customers as well, albeit pretty big customers um, and somebody internal that has everybody's email address and can go look them up, but that's a, a, a different matter. Uh, but having monitoring agents installed on all of your servers, um, having a set of metrics that can help you understand what that looks like and then feed that all into a big data uh, platform. They have, they've built something called Cosmos uh, where they feed all of that data in and then they're able to use a query uh, platform called that they uh, built called uh, Cousteau uh, that allows them to analyze that data um, and look for, for trends, look for things that are, are worrying. Um, so you can have monitors and you can have alerts. That's uh, reactive. The alert triggers, you get a notification, you're going to go do something about it. Um, but also, is there trends that you can look for uh, in the data analysis uh, to see when something's going to happen, even maybe uh, before it does? Uh, so they have uh, access to Azure Diagnostics. 
The use app insights, application insights is built on top of Azure and it allows you to, on any platform, um, they have APIs for all the platforms. It's just a, a set of services, um, collect and analyze uh, metrics. And then they feed all of that data into an Azure data lake. And a lot of these systems, the, the features were built out as part of uh, a lot of teams at Microsoft moving towards this model. It's a very powerful platform. I use it myself on, on, on my tools as well. And something that they, they really realized was that they have to gather everything. There's, there's, <laughs> there's no data that is unimportant. Uh, you've got to gather data about your SLAs. You've got to gather data about alerts, uh, your DevOps pipelines, your experiments that are going on. You're going to collect data about your network performance, your uh, platform, all of the things that are going on, even down to traces, telemetry, perflux, everything is going to be uh, collected in that way. Uh, and at the moment, uh, or at least at the point in time where I uh, got, got access uh, to an understanding of the volume of data, uh, they were collecting about seven terabytes of data per day on average uh, with people using the system uh, and getting an understanding of all of that data, KPIs, job history, perf counters, traces, activity logs, uh, platform and network capabilities. So in order to do that, you really have to understand uh, the, the customer experience telemetry. Uh, so a user accesses the system it goes through a bunch of tiers, possibly it potentially accesses the database and then serves a result back to the customer. All, all of your interactivity with, uh, with many of these systems is user activated. And when it's user activated, you really have to understand the flow. Um, and one of the things that the Azure DevOps team do is they have a, an ID that is generated for every like call into the system that they pass all the way through down to SQL Server and they collect performance and trace uh, across the board. Uh, there's actually a, a front end flag that you can turn on. Um, I'll maybe try and look it up uh, or, or speak to one of the teams to see how you turn that on again. I can never remember. Oh, underscore diagnostics. On, uh, let's see if I can figure it out. Uh, Dev.com. Bring that across. I will bring it across in just a sec. Let me do that. Uh, not there because that will not get a. I need to switch directory. Where is my naked agility? I'm just uh, switching to, uh, I have a lot of Azure DevOps that I have access to, a lot of different uh, platforms and systems. Uh, so I'm just going to bring that up. It is just taking its time to load. So maybe I stick it over here and uh, do it, show you that once it's loaded. Oh, no, I have to hit switch at the bottom. Don't you love it when you've got a tall screen and the buttons way at the bottom? That's a user experience. So uh, they're able to collect uh, that telemetry, that perf telemetry across uh, their entire organization. Uh, so let me go into my migration tools uh, setup. Let's see if I can remember how to do this. I'm pretty sure it's underscore. Oh. Is it underscore diagnostics? It is. That's what happens when you've been working with the team for too long. So if I turn on diagnostics and perf bar, um, you can do this on any of your accounts as well. I just want to show you um, what it is that, you know, the kind of capabilities that they're collecting. Uh, you can see at the bottom of the screen, it's very small. Uh, can I pop a mag, oh, can I pop a magnifying glass? Magnifier, there we go. Whoa, that is not what I wanted yet. Ooh. Okay, that's not working very well. But if I, <laughs> I suck at that, I need to get better at that. Uh, nope, it's not letting me. Say what? Boom, there we go. Uh, if I 
zoom in now. Right, there we go. Pew. You can see, I don't know if you can see that. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, okay. Maybe not, but there's a perf bar at the bottom of the page here. You can see uh, performance. If I pop that up, I'm going to kill Magnifier so it makes it easier to see this. Uh, but if I pop that up, uh, it's collecting the, the trace and time and things that have happened throughout the entire system, all the way through every web service, down to every database call, every plugin, uh, so that you can go analyze that. If you're one of the developers on this team, you want as much data as possible to go figure that out. Um, and you can see at the bottom, there's actually a little smiley face there. Um, I don't know if you can see that all the way down there. Little smiley face. Uh, that means it met the KPI uh, for how long pages are supposed to load. Uh, if you have a smiley face, if you have a sad place, things are not going so well. Uh, and it says all is good. All the checks are, are working out. So that's one of the ways... Uh, that the team are able to uh, leverage that. And for some reason, I have lost all of the buttons on my office. Uh, so let me just close that and reopen it so I can get back showing you. There we go, I've got it back. Don't you love it when... Let's find, where were we? We were about... There, okay. It's like, there we go. Uh, so they have this uh, ability to correlate everything across the board end to end um, and have that uh, set up and, and, and working. Uh, they can see all the dependencies, they can get all of the telemetry data and set all of that up. And it means that they can uh, uh, check uh, and have um, metrics and trend analysis to see what's going on and when something goes below uh, the trend that they want, they can dive in uh, and see exactly uh, when things happened, what the problem was, how many people were affected and be able to, 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 get, <laughs> to get that perf, get access uh, to that extra information uh, that they have. Uh, and getting that extended down all the way to their dependencies. So if they're dependent upon uh, uh, the SQL Server, um, the SQL Services, then they're able to to get all of that as well and see the dependency activities. I mean, the amount of data uh, that they collect is unbelievable because they need to keep a system up with all of uh, the software engineers uh, that are uh, users of this system you know, checking in code. Think think of if Azure DevOps goes down, all of the millions of people that use it and all of the companies that have their software engineers reliant upon it, they're all down, they're all unavailable. It's not a good place to, know, to, to be. Um, so you need to be able to go deep on the telemetry and really understand what's going on at every level. Uh, they do have uh, activity log schema. I'm just going to go through this very quickly. Uh, I am happy to provide the slides uh, to anybody who wants to uh, give me a shout. I will do that. Uh, but they collect all of their uh, telemetry across the board, really understand. And that tool that I just showed, oh, there we go. There's the URL. I did not even know it was in here, but they surface that data uh, to the developers uh, so that they can they can see it and get access to it. So you can do that as well uh, and see that performance on your copy of the system to see what data is available. Um, they also aggregate it across the entire service so they get an insight as to um, and what's going on holistically, but also per customer as well. If you've got uh, everybody at a particular customer that's down, then we need to go deal with that. It, it's it's not okay to say we have 5,000 customers and one customer is down, so that's not so bad. That one customer is down. Everybody at that one customer cannot do uh, the job that they do on the service. So you need to make sure uh, that you can see uh, that as well and see it in real time 
so that you can do something uh, about it and get a true understanding of uh, what's going on. So I think uh, that's that's uh, super, super duper important, okay? Um, that idea that uh, <laughs> customers are a bag of sand. I love that one. Um, every grain of sand is a customer and every grain is important. If somebody is having a problem, they're going to tell 10 of their friends uh, that they have a problem. Um, and you can see here they're, they're doing an impact threshold um, to understand uh, when do we need to have a, a bigger conversation when we're in breach of SLA uh, so that we can go do something about it. Uh, but also the, the team, I know that they go back over this data to see even the, the smaller blips when people had problems or performance problems, let's go talk to the customer, figure out what the problem was and what can we do to go uh, uh, and, and, and fix that up. Um, you've got to find a balance uh, between uh, the amount of noise, the amount of data you get and uh, uh, having you know the alerts to the developers. Uh, you've got to be able to push uh, new features at the same time. So if everybody's interrupted all the time, uh, so trying to minimize those alerts so that they're only the things that are important. You, you'll you know if you get an email uh, that is, uh, uh, you get 100 emails from one service, you're going to either turn that service off, turn the emails off, or create a rule and shove them in a folder somewhere where nobody will ever see them. So uh, that's, that's, oh, I went the wrong way. That's uh, really important. So balancing uh, that noise to signal. So then you also need to be able to respond as quickly as possible uh, to the problems that, that, that come up. Um, you can't have the development team chucking uh, that code over the wall, over the fence to the software engineer, the, the operations team. Um, because what they op op what's going to happen is the operations team uh, are going to just bolt on uh, some type of monitoring that they can the, what they can do. Whereas if engineering, the dev team is building out the monitoring, they are able to add deep holistic monitoring into their application um, and have a, a much better experience for the engineers that are trying to figure out the problem, operations who are trying to support and maintain it. Uh, so they built around this idea of uh, SRE, bringing DevOps and SRE together. They'd already had, they used to have uh, uh, developers, coders, testers, and operations as completely separate teams. Uh, now they've got a combined engineering team, uh, which has feature team engineers, which are your traditional coders and testers. That's bringing, bringing that group together. Um, that's your feature team engineers. Uh, but also on the same team, they have uh, live site engineers, okay? Um, they have two two pieces of that story. I've got it here in blue and pur uh, sorry, uh, purple and blue. Yeah, blue and purple. Uh, they have a feature team live site engineer, which is a rotating role uh, for the feature team engineers. So at least one of the, if not two of the feature uh, team engineers for a sprint will be designated as a feature team live site engineer. That live site engineer um, is not going to be looking at, uh, at value work, i.e. your traditional sprint backlog. They are solely going to be looking at uh, work to help improve stability of the platform, uh, maintain and manage uh, that. Um, they also have access to site reliability engineers who are dedicated uh, site reliability engineering folks um, that have deep expertise in platform and uh, uh, monitoring um, to leverage. And they're all part of the same team. You have a combined engineering team that includes the rotating roles as well as the dedicated uh, live site SRE. Uh, site reliability engineering is an important concept to... Uh, create a world in which uh, we can we can get very quick at delivering to a, a, a platform that's up as much as possible. Um, so we want to automate as much as possible, uh, but there are always going to be things that we 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 have to do. 
uh, you might have some kind of compliance, uh, security. Uh, those are all things that we have to do. And this is the, 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 the pyramid of things we must do up to the most valuable things at the top. So product contributions uh, are at the top. And a live site engineer, that, that feature site, Feature live site engineer and site reliability engineer are going to be working together um, and doing stuff at the bottom of this pyramid and then flowing as those things are complete up to the top of the top of the pyramid. So uh, the last thing they do is product contributions uh, when everything else is complete. Uh, so it's a, a, a powerful uh, story because they have to be able to respond to alerts. Uh, those are the folks the assigned uh, feature lifesite engineers are the ones that get woken up at three o'clock in the morning uh, to go deal with that problem. Uh, the team, uh, the, the Azure DevOps team have built, a, um, I don't know what you call it, a, a, an alerting system, an auto routing system um, with different ways those alerts can be triggered. Social, uh, humans, that's a support call, uh, alerting and customer support. Um, goes into a rules engine and then allocates that to uh, the, uh, the the combined engineering team uh, that is accountable for that part of the system, that part of the code. And then they go do an impact assessment and decide what they want to do. Um, how are they going to respond uh, to, this, to this problem? Are they going to do a, a generic uh, business hours investigation? They'll put it on the backlog. We'll get to it in the morning when everybody wakes up. Um, or are we going to have to wake a bunch of people up and do the 24-7 live incident? Um, when a live incident happens, they're going to create a, a, a bridge, an incident bridge with all the people on it that they need it to go figure that out. So the feature team lifesite engineer is on there. They're the allocated person on the engineering team, as well as the SREs. But maybe they need to bring in additional partners like... Uh, if SQL Server is operating uh, slow, then maybe they have to bring in somebody from Azure. Uh, executive leadership might be brought in. There might be an incident manager. There are all sorts of things that are triggered in order to, to make those things happen, get everybody together and get a resolution to the problem. That idea of having uh, those uh, uh, live site team inside of a software engineering team uh, so they have slightly bigger teams than you would traditionally see for Scrum teams. Uh, Scrum teams are traditionally uh, between three and nine. Uh, they, this group do between 10 and 12 people. Uh, they have two people on the team that is the live site team. So they have a feature team, which are looking at the sprint backlog and dealing with those issues. And then the live site team only deals uh, with live site issues and interruptions. So they're shielding the team uh, from uh, uh, those potential disruptions uh, while still um, uh, uh, working on things that would add value to the product, but from the perspective of life site issues. So mitigating things for future uh, uh, life site issues. And that, that group is a rotating group. It will be a different group each, uh, each sprint. Uh, so again, they have, Priorities, if there's a live site incident, that's their highest priority. If there is no live site incident, then they're going to be looking at past live site mitigation tasks. So that could be uh, things that enable us uh, to get better at live site, or it could be things that we've identified as being a problem that really end up in that category of technical debt. Uh, things that are not automated, uh, things that are not quite in a way they need to be in, and do that. And then they're going to look at improvements in monitoring telemetry and alerts uh, way before they look at adding any, any new features. That is their focus. Uh, so the team uh, that works on this, uh, they do um, three-week sprints. Uh, so during... Uh, uh, sprint, for example, during Sprint 124, the deployment is ongoing for Sprint 123. It takes a long time to do a deployment on a large system like this. So it takes more than a, 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 a few days. It takes more than a week, to be honest, to, to get that deployed. Um, so they have the life site engineers are working alongside 
at the feature team, uh, but they're kind of working at, at loggerheads there. So they also need to be able to manage uh, uh, things at scale. And the only way to do that is to automate. We need to automate everything. We need to automate as much as possible. Uh, people, people make mistakes. Uh, that's one of the reasons to automate. People need to go to sleep and people forget things. Uh, think about that engineering team at the start for um, um, the Knight Capital Group uh, that neglected to deploy to one of the servers. Uh, people forget things, people make mistakes. Automated processes uh, can tell us when they fail, when they don't get everything done. Uh, so being able to troubleshoot those uh, ideas, uh, if we're automating, uh, we can have alerts uh, that find uh, things much, much quicker uh, and realize that something's uh, wrong. And um, once you start mitigating your problems, uh, you, you might have some manual mitigations that you have to do. Uh, that would be, uh, you know, the first uh, thing that might happen. But if something like that happens often and you have the same mitigation task, uh, you can get it to be uh, uh, aut automate the mitigation as well. Have the automated engine flip that switch uh, and then notify the engineers that there's a problem that they need to go fix. But you've already mitigated the problem. That doesn't mean we don't have work to do because um, we're... Uh, uh, we're monitoring the health all the time. We're understanding when those mitigating tasks have been activated and how do we get better uh, at not <laughs> having those problems in the first place. That's really important. Uh, getting to the root cause is important. Doing some kind of post-mortem to really understand um, what can be done uh, to to make our product better, to improve quality, uh, so that we don't have those issues in the future. Um, each team, each feature team, has their own uh, goals and measures and uh, 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 repair times that they can monitor and see uh, what's happening and be able to um, be able to respond to change more quickly. How do we know when a team is uh, uh, being good at responding to change? Uh, they should be repairing problems that come up quickly. They should be having less problems over time. Uh, these are indications that we can we can look at to 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 go see. So, kind of in conclusion, uh, we need quality and transparency to build customer uh, trust. We need to have uh, 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 full transparency so the customers see everything that's going on. We, we, we talk to them about the problems, we help uh, figure out how to make them better, and, and we, we make sure everybody's involved. Um, we collect as much telemetry as possible so that we can have better insights into what's going on. Uh, we need to organize around responding more quickly. Uh, so that's with alerts, uh, with call chains, uh, with understanding uh, who do we have to go deal with who do I have to go wake up and the LSEs and engineering team uh, live site uh, uh, team inside of the engineering team is 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 what allows for that for this group um, and automate everything um, as far as I'm concerned if it's not automated it's technical debt that's something you need to go work on uh, you shouldn't have anything that is not automated and then you have to get as close to the root cause as possible in order to uh, continuously improve and try and uh, figure out what those things are. And just to uh, wrap up, um, there are some good, uh, well, I'll make myself smaller. There we go. Uh, there are some good uh, articles, uh, videos there on SRE at Microsoft, how the different teams do it um, and what they mean by that. Uh, if I, how do I make myself disappear desktop? No. Tell you what, I'll move over here. There we go. So you can get a, a, a picture of that. Uh, go to that URL um, and you will be able to uh, download this presentation. Uh, please feel free uh, to get in touch with me uh, anytime uh, you want to. I am on Microsoft Teams. 
on uh, that URL. I'm on Twitter and you can WhatsApp me uh, and find more information on my blog. I'm happy to share presentations. All you have to do is ask. Okay, thank you very much uh, for listening and I hope uh, you're able to come to one of our uh, Scrum classes. We deliver uh, a number of Scrum.org classes uh, and we are delivering all of our courses and material as live virtual classrooms at the moment. Um, so please go take a look uh, at nkdagility.com. Okay, thank you very much. Like and subscribe. Thank you.